we were thinking it would be a nice opener for people generally to think about, um, to think back, to see if they could predict when they started out in postgraduate life where they'd come to and whether that's a surprise, whether you anticipated your career trajectory and the significance it would have in policy circles. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah um, well, I, I think so any of the graduate students seeing this will know that when you're a graduate student, the main hurdle is getting a full-time job. And, and uh, I don't know what the figures are in English, but it's something like, you know, one in ten will go on to get a job in academia. Mm. It's really, really bad. Mm. Um, so uh, I had no idea. Obviously, when I was doing my PhD, um, I was doing it because I was really interested in the subject and because I wanted to get an academic job. And I didn't think much beyond getting a, a permanent contract. Mm. And so um, I had, uh, uh, after my PhD, a couple of years doing part-time jobs here and there. And again, I was just focusing on getting a, a permanent job. So I had no, I had no sense that my anything I did might go to anything apart from that landing me a job. However, in retrospect, um, one of the things that I, one of the courses I taught, sort of jobbing, visiting lecture, going mm. around the places, was a course which uh, I called the called the Politics of English, and was it about um, the it was about the discipline of English and its history and its development and what that sort of meant. So it was it was sort of already like like a bit of my thesis had been reflective on the discipline, and interested in things like how the government over 120 years shaped the discipline, interested in how the discipline responded to extradisciplinary, sort of non-literary kind of pressures, how the discipline was shaped by universities. So I suppose, and that's part of uh, the first chapter of my thesis too, so um, I constantly had a, a, a slight interest in... The bigger picture. Well, yeah, things outside directly what I was working on. So I had, didn't have any idea of that. Mm. Um, was that quite a niche? Were many people working that area? That sounds like quite a niche aspect it was, it at was, the time. It was quite niche, but mm. I suppose it was also being interested in... Um, I'd always been very interested in, in politics and the political, mm. and uh, sometimes that sort of interest runs to you know, the more abstract, but I'd always been quite interested in how things actually boil down to actual, you know, policy and decisions and deciding things. So I remember when I was, um, before I started my PhD, I was very involved in local politics and there was a huge debate about a cycle path and whether it should go on the pavement or on the road, mm. all right? And in the end, because of various complications, it went a bit on the pavement and a bit on the road. But what was, what was quite interesting from an academic point of view is how, from an anthropological point of view, is how that decision sort of came mm. down, it didn't come down to whether you thought Marx was right or Thatcher was right, it came down to much more local institutional corporate sort of pressures. Mm. So that was sort of on my mind. Mm. Mm. And again, that's also given, um, I read a lot of Foucault, that's about institutions and power in that sort of, in that detailed kind of way. So that led me to think about those sorts of things. My first book which got me my job was a, you know, very traditional kind of thesis kind of book. It was a bit of um, original research, it was, you know, fine. But then I had these two years jobbing, teaching here, there and everywhere, two, uh, three years, and I knew I couldn't write a research book, but I wrote a book that came out one of my courses, a first year sort of theory course I caught, taught called Doing English, mm -hmm. because one of the things that I'd seen was there was a huge gap between the what the students had done at A-level mm -hmm. and what they were doing at university, and it wasn't a gap of... Um, like in most subjects, a gap of sort of intensity or quality. Yes. It was a gap because the subject at university was a different subject from A level. Mm. A level was still very traditional, um, very uh, levisite in all sorts of ways, and university had not been like that for ten years, ten or fifteen years. Mm. So they were completely lost. They say to me, "Why are we reading this linguist? Why are we reading this philosopher?" And for me, as a graduate student, it was like, "Well, obviously, because we, we all do Derrida now." Yeah. Um, but for them, they were completely at sea. So the book we aimed to sort of bridge that mm. gap. And uh, it turned out there were lots of people, secondary school teachers, and um, actually many secondary school teachers, but also people who taught teachers, uh, who saw that was that book was filling a really important gap. Mm. 
oh, that's really badly phrased, was, yeah. was, 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 was bridging a, a chasm that needs to be bridged. And so they invited me to come and talk to them and do things. I discovered a whole community who were trying to um, change the institution of education in literature, yes. change the institution of English the subject. And um, there's an organisation called the, the English Media Centre, mm -hmm. which used to be part of the London Educational Authority to train teachers. Mm -hmm. It's now an independent educational charity, and they're very involved in, in catching English up. Um, and I think it's very, I mean, more globally, it's a very normal process that, you know, in universities, the disciplines, whether it's anthropology or physics or science, is, you know, cutting edge and doing new things and experimental, okay? And those trickle down more slowly through the educational system. Mm -hmm. And in English, there are various um, forms of resistance to that. You know, people don't like feminist readings of Shakespeare or whatever it might happen to be. Um, but that hadn't happened and these people were trying to make it happen and it turned out that my book which grew out of the experience of teaching was a useful tool for mm. that and because of that I became very involved with um, something called the English Reform Group mm -hmm. which is a, a group gang of like-minded teachers and teacher trainers um, and I met uh, Deering of the Deering Report mm -hmm. and so slowly I realised there was a sort of uh, policy impact of, mm. of what, I would, what I'd done had you anticipated that when you were writing it or when the idea no. of the book occurred to you? No, the, the, the idea of this uh, textbook mm -hmm. w was to try and explain to students, you know, yeah. that they had they'd now crossed a, a chasm, not just of, you know, we're doing things more intensely now, but of, of how we think about things yes. and things have changed. So I had no sense of that. But when I became aware that there was a, a um, there were people who were, who were keen to change yeah. that in secondary education, yes. Then I thought, oh, that's really interesting. And then, through the English Reform Group, yeah. I found myself uh, talking to all sorts of people. I was invited on to the government quango called Ofqual. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it wasn't called Ofqual. It's now called Ofqual. Or something like that. It was called the Qualifications and QCDA, Qualifications and Curriculum, Curriculum Development Authority. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so... Before we get to that bit of the story, I want to say the, the thing that I, I learned about the policy impact then was not that my research was... I had no idea my research would be useful in that sort of way at all, but I was very open to talking to people who could see that it was. Mm. So I spent a lot of time chatting to people, chatting to teachers, chatting to teachers to teachers, and finding out about the mechanics and how these things worked. Mm -hmm. So it was rather an eye-opener to me to discover how the... Uh, a-level exam boards and the government and the Qualifications and Development Curriculum Authority all work together. Mm. And when I I had had quite a lot of conversations with people for whom this was second nature, so well, how does it work? And they'd explain, and all these things are quite long and complicated and difficult to explain. Okay, so basically the exam boards put their exams, the curricula, up for tender. Mm -hmm. In those days, the QCDA would say it was appropriate uh, A-level exam or not, okay, and then it would be endorsed, basically. So um, I did some work for the exam boards, helping them shape their exams, but mainly I did some work, some consultancy work for the Qualifications and Curriculum Development Authority. Mm -hmm. And what we did was we, we they were revamping their Curriculum 2000, mm -hmm. National Curriculum, in 2005 and I was involved in that revamping. Mm -hmm. I, I read all the specs from the different exam boards. Um, we sat in a darkened room in central London, underground room, talking about discipline, talking about the exams. Um, we had some interesting arguments um, and we changed what the exam specs were. There's something called the assessment objectives, which is how the sort of marking criteria for A-levels. So we changed those. We changed some things on the curriculum. Uh, one thing I'm secretly very proud of in 2005 is I we, I led it on the committee um, sort of demand there be one post-1990 bit of writing because I was slagged off in the Daily Mail being too modern, so I felt I succeeded. Um, and there were all, all sorts of things like that. So in a way, it's hard to say... I mean, the 1990 thing is one thing that I, I sort of led the charge on. There, and there were various other things that people discussed and yeah. so on. Um we weren't allowed to discuss, obviously, taking Shakespeare off the A-level curriculum. Right. 
something for the yeah, yeah, yeah. That's in fact, they, the head of the organisation came round and said, you can do anything you want, but you can't have Shakespeare. Right. It's fine. <laughs> uh, but so it, it was sort of working on a committee, working with interested people, interested in this, in this sort of detail. It's like the deep software of education. You know, it's like right down in the, mm-hmm. in the institutional like code. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're changing things about. And then... Um, well, I, just to go back, yeah. When um, say when your fir- your book was first published, yeah, that was doing English, English yeah. just those, was really the significant work, wasn't it? Um, was that reviewed? I mean, how did do teachers routinely read? Silly question, but how did that then? Oh, that's spread? a re- that's a well, really good question. I don't know. Um, um, I suppose that um, you didn't do anything proactively. You didn't sort of send it around. No, in fact, I had a very sad conversation with some. Uh, publishers, academic publishers, and they said we do not know how to market academic books. The only way we do have to do it is to do it through, like you know, uh, brochures and stuff, mm. and getting on reading lists. And yeah. it was like, yes, but you've got people who get paid thousands of pounds to do this. You've got no idea. Um, so I, I didn't really know how to market it. I, I, I think it was because it, it, it fell into this yeah. hole, and there had been nothing. I mean, there are books introducing literary theory and so on, but there'd be nothing trying to bridge that gap. Yeah. And also because it came so much out of the experience of teaching. Yeah. Uh, and I was also very lucky when I was writing it, because obviously my first research book is a, you know, certainly with tons of footnotes and extremely long sentences and, you know, you know obscure people for experts in the field to see the tiny bit of, you know, research my PhD added to human knowledge. Um, and that's great, and I'm all for that. I love doing that sort of stuff. It's really important. It's, the, it's what we academic universities are about. Um, but when I tried to write a bit like that for this book for students, there was an editor at Routledge, uh, uh, Liz Thompson, who just took my style apart. apart. Yeah. And basically she taught me to write in a way which was as accessible as possible yeah. and sort of bullshit-free. And um, skill. Well, it is a great skill most of the time. But sometimes you think it's some, it means that you write much shorter than you than you do. People say mm. you've got a six thousand word article, and you think oh, I said all I want to say in three thousand words. What do I can do with the remaining three thousand words? But generally, it is a good skill to try and write as clearly as possible. Yes, I can relate to that. Yeah, I mean, I actually that's one wonder if that's something that's we need to include on our list for students because I think it is a skill that is that is usually learnt unless people have got a journalistic background yeah. to be able but as you say to be able to do both is, is difficult then to yeah. switch between styles uh, and also I think um, there's a, a huge psychic thing which is that when you're um, writing academic stuff my subsequent academic books or, um, mm. you're writing with a sense with, with the various very cleverest people the very most educated close people who know all about Levinas and Heidegger and Plato, and they know all about that, and they're sitting on your shoulder saying, "No, no, that's right. You've got to. That's wrong. How do you? Do, you know, you do. So you're you're constantly trying to trying to make your argument as clear and mm. de- developed and original as possible. Mm. But when you're writing for students um, or for the general public, it's a different sort of writing. You you can afford to be um, clearer. You can afford to be less qualified. Mm-hmm. And what you're looking for is people to say, oh, I, I, I really understood that, mm-hmm. okay? Not, oh, it was wrong or it was right or what an amazing contribution to human knowledge. Yeah. And it's that sense of, of communicating. communicating and clarity that seems really important. Mm-hmm. But that's quite a mental shift from normal research writing. Um, and so I now edit a series for, for Routledge, and I say to the people who write it, look, you're not trying to impress a professor at Harvard, okay? The, the compliment is, you made this extremely clear. Okay, that, that's when you know it's a good book. Mm. Um, and also the sense that, that um, like Wittgenstein's Ladder, you know, books for students and for the general public are to, be, it are to be read and then kicked away. It's like, now I understand this, now I can go on to a more complex understanding. Mm, mm. To understand it as a, a process rather mm. than as a sort of end result. So I suppose also back going back, um, those when you were invited into those closed circles did did that just was they just emails pop well maybe it was pre-email <laughs> were they just things that appeared on your desk these invitations um, how that all worked it's partially well it all it's, it came it came through networks mm. it came through some things occasionally pop onto your desk would come and do this talk here 
and but lots of stuff was through the networks I'd made and the people I'd talked to and they'd seen I was interested in something mm. and they you know they find it useful mm. a, a, and um, take exam boards for example yeah. I mean um, it, it's often hard to remember that that we're you know in demand for people because people want academics to come and share their expertise and I know as it were from it can seem from our point of view that if you know you've done a PhD on Conrad, you might not know if you know about Conrad, but not about much else. But in fact, compared to um, other people who haven't worked that level of intensity, you do sort of have a, mm. a, a wider and different sort of sense that they do want you. Mm. And so if you want them, they want you. That, mm. that sort of works. Mm, mm. Um, and then um, it's also the case that when, you, when external agencies ask you, you can always ask them how much work it involves. You know, uh, and if it's too much work, you can say no. Mm -hmm. um, although I have to say, when I was beginning, I, I usually said yes to things, even if it was too much work, because it was, it was a learning experience, mm -hmm. finding out how things work. You're finding about sort of the, the deep software, if you see what I mean. Yeah. And, and they usually pay. Yeah. Um, and, um, and how does that work with, were you full-time when this yeah. was Yeah. Um, are you able to do consulting? At, yeah, at I mean, the, there's, a certain amount of, there's a certain amount of... So um, encouraged. Well, yeah, you're encouraged to do it, and uh, I can't remember the d details. I did go and talk to the finance office when it first, when it stopped being, you know, fifty pounds. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there are different. I can't remember the ins and outs, but there are different sorts of consultancy. Some, if it's thousands and thousands, thousands of pounds, it has to go through the university, mm -hmm. and then you don't see it. Yeah. But if it's a smaller amount than that, then then you can take it as your own yeah. fee, and then you declare it as tax income. Yeah. Um, and I'm ashamed to say now that. I have a sort of division in my mind between stuff that comes out of my research, mm -hmm. which obviously I do for free and it's part of academic life mm -hmm. and our engagement with the public and so on, and stuff which comes, I, I sort of file it in my mind under teaching, which mm -hmm. I, I expect to be paid for or I ask for money for. Yeah. Um, and if they, um, if they don't offer money... For most of these, for, not for the research things, but these things, yeah. I don't do it. Yeah, that's very sensible. Um, well, because it's time. Yes, exactly. Um, Got competing demands. Yeah. But then you also you you become known for somebody who's you become known in the sort of network of people as somebody who's interested, as someone who can do the do the stuff, as somebody who also understands the 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 limits of working in a different environment. Mm. You know, so. There are complicated uh, arguments over the nature of close reading, which is a sort of key skill in English, and reading a poem in great mm, detail. Mm. And there are, there's, you know, 90 years of complicated arguments about it, um, which you write about in your thesis or whatever. But when it's been discussed at A-level, those, in a way, the arguments are not really relevant, except in one tiny little bit to help shape what, what's going on. Do you see what I mean? Yes. Um, uh, and again, a very typical academic thing is to say, is to unroll the history of a debate and say, well, in 1927, this, and then this, and this, people don't care about that. What they want to know is, you know, as it were, what is it you think? And in the end, why you think that? So can you, that's the convincing yeah. question. I think this, here are the three reasons I think it. Are you convinced? What do we think? Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's quite a sort of, mental shift too yes did you find that once you had a much greater understanding of the software as you say and the processes what um how these syllabi are shaped and so forth it, did it has it impacted on your your academic research or um or academic life it hasn't impacted on my research except when i've been writing research things in this area about the, the english and its politics mm. and its shape and so on um, it's Im it's impacted on my teaching mm -hmm. because I'm much more aware not only of what the students have done and haven't done but as it were of of um, about the code behind them like why they've been done certain things mm -hmm. the reasons behind things that they don't even mm -hmm. properly understand because mm -hmm. um, why would they because they're just doing it mm -hmm. um, so I'm much more aware of their limitations and abilities and, and so on Mm -hmm. uh, and what they don't, what they don't know, and what they're desperate to know, and so in fact, we, I teach a course, or just started to teach a course called um, "Thinking as a Critic." So it's a course about 
Mm. For the first year is about transition from a school or college into university life and into thinking in, in um, as a literary critic, so thinking in a sort of disciplinary kind of way. Mm. Um, so it's impacted on my teaching quite mm. a lot, mm. um, but perhaps not on my research except mm. in this sort of area. Mm. Definitely. And do you think you've been able to pass that experience on to colleagues and the departments as a whole? Uh, I'd like to think so. I don't have to ask my colleagues. Yes. I mean, but for example, because lots of things are about networks, mm. okay, um, th there are lots of things that I'm, I'm quite keen... There are lots of things you do sort of mid-career, like mm. being on exam boards, for mm. example. So I've been quite keen to try and pass those things onto younger colleagues and say, look, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. It's a really good thing for these reasons. I don't care if you do it or not, but here's, the thing, here's an opportunity and I'll put you in contact with the right person and see if you want to mm. do it. So I do that quite a lot mm, mm. because I think that's really important to bring people on mm -hmm. because another thing that had gone wrong yeah. in English as an institution was there had been a generation of people who'd been involved with the institutional... Um, operators, if you see what I mean, mm -hmm. with exam boards and so on, and then there was a gap. And because of the impact of the, well, the research excellence framework or research, because of the changing nature of universities, mm -hmm. because of, um, in some ways, the strength of English, there was a sort of 50 or 20 year gap where people hadn't done anything. They hadn't got involved with the institutions or with making policy or with so on. Or if they had, there were very few in number. Mm -hmm. So there was a huge gap and I, I, I suppose I, mean, I went to a meeting at the British Council about the nature of English and um, I remember it really well I just started so I was very young academic and I had my sort of weddings funerals bar mitzvahs interview suit on and um, I went into this room and surrounding me I was late of course and surrounding me were about 15 of the most famous professors in English in the country who I'd seen give conference papers, and I thought, fuck, oh, sorry, you can't get it out. But like, uh, and I was the youngest person by about 25 years. And, um, you know, whenever anything, everywhere they said, um, well, we'll turn, move to a younger generation, they'd all creak and turn at me. <laughs> uh, and, um, but I thought that I, at the time, I was completely embarrassed and obviously a bit flattered narcissistically. But also thinking, why is this not full of young people who are doing the teaching, young career academics, early career academics, why are there not lots and lots of Bob Eaglestones all around the place? So um, I try quite hard to try and introduce people into that. I don't know how well I succeed, but because mm. people think educational software is very boring, but, but it, it really is important. And mm. um, when you, and it sounds monomaniacal, but you know, that, I managed to get a 1990 book onto the A-level curricula, impacts 50,000 students, uh, A-level students every year, yeah. and they're 20,000 teachers, and it's a profound, tiny, 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 but profound change. It is, um, and one that stays with you, because I mean, I remember the books I've done at high school English level, um, intimately, and you keep that with you through life, don't yeah, you? Yeah, exactly. So I think, I think those policy changes are... I, you can't say, oh, Bob did that, but it's part of the, I was part of the structure that did do that, and that's really, really important. It's important mm. to have um, you know, university talk in there. Mm, definitely, and, I agree. And it also means that when, um, you know, when it comes to policy and education, the government is obviously the, 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 the tide, the, the main current, and it's hard to swim against it. But when there are things that happen, um, because you know how the things work in, the, in detail, you're able to do things. So there was an extremely complicated change about 18 months ago about GCSEs, mm -hmm. and it would have led to a... I'm not going to explain it. It's just too complicated to explain. Um, it's like two paragraphs of newsprint to explain even roughly how it is. Anyway, it was a stupid governmental change. Because I understood how it all worked, I was able to explain at length to other people. We organised a campaign... And this tiny bit of educational software code was changed, and the result was that English literature GCSE didn't collapse as a specification. Which is so it was a tiny little victory against the sort of government tide. Mm. And my guess is it wasn't uh, evil Michael Goh with his plan to destroy English. It was a misunderstanding in the Department for Education, which just needed clarification right. and 
so on. That's That's really interesting. Though. Yeah, it's really fascinating. And it's, it strikes me sorry, that what you, you provide is consistency that when fashion, not fashions, it belittles it, but when government policy shifts, as it always does over years, um, in your position, you're able to provide that knowledge and consistency in your own views that have been developed based on thorough research, ultimately, that is able to be that middleman. Yeah, I think that's some, I, I think that's something. I think there's there's some truth in that. I I, I don't know about consistency because obviously your views change. That's, that's true but, too. but it's also a sense of of um, knowing the detail of how things work. Because mm. when it's, it seems to be about policy, um, I mean, all academics have have ideas and, and thoughts and positions they've developed and so on. Particularly in, in my field, which is you know, very abstruse, literary theory, European philosophy, it's all very abstract. Mm. But knowing the details of how things work means you're able to say, look, right down here, again, in the software, here's the bit of thing you have to change and redo, and here's how we go. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's the, it's the knowing the details that's important. Mm -hmm. So, for example, at the moment, the government has reviewed GCSE uh, A-levels, and is not, is, there's an A-level in creative writing, which is sort of really important for the English family of subjects, and it's not, um, it's cancelled that A-level, basically. Right. And so we're now, there's now a disciplinary campaign to try and change that decision. I don't think it'll work, because the tide is against it. But that's the sense of, you know, I know who to talk to, what to pull, and what the reasons are. And I know a little bit how to speak their language. So you, you, know, you name the case. report specifically, and so you're... Mm. Um, is that because of lack of numbers? Or is it uh, no, I think there's... That there's well, no one really knows. I think there are t I, there's sort of what's said publicly and what's said privately. What's said publicly is that um, the creative writing A level is too close to English literature, which isn't true, and it's more skills based than knowledge based, which also isn't true. But that's they've been given two sentences. Uh, what people have said privately is the Secretary of State for Education thinks it's nonsense that shouldn't be taught. Mm. So that that's part of the tide thing. Yes. Um, and that's also a sense of knowing what what battles you can fight, what battles you can't fight. That's and, a really important point, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and and knowing what sort of level you are. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm not a very high level person. I may be a professor and have a lovely office, well, a very messy office. But um, you know, a, a junior civil servant is quite liberty to to ignore what I have to say, and so it's sort of seeing, mm -hmm. you know. That's very interesting. So, and, and knowing that knowledge of where you are, I, I suppose in a way it's obvious, but it's probably something that you sense more and more with it, just with experience. Yeah, and, and, and well, also as your narcissism gets chipped away, yeah. you go to a meeting and think, oh, I'm the, the famous professor, you know, you know. and in fact, like you're no, you're nobody. Really. Right. So, okay, and they don't know who you are. They've never read a, they've never read yeah. a book about Levinas. They don't care that you've written a fantastic monograph about this. They're not interested in that. They want to, they want to do their policy stuff, and that's sort of fine as well. Yeah. And, um, you know, and also it's really interesting. It's just really interesting to see the nuts and bolts of how stuff happens. And how decisions are made. You know, and then how it, how it emerges three weeks later in the newspaper. You think, well, that, that's, that, how did that get by that? Mm. Um, and it's just that sort of stuff is really fascinating. And you find out how to lobby people, mm -hmm. how proper lobbying works. You know, it's no good writing to the minister for the things declared. You've got to find their their special advisor six months previously, okay? And you've got to do things, I mean, one of the problems of, with acad academia and policy is that um, every time, particularly in the, in the arts humanities, is that the, it's almost always too late. So when something is announced, yeah. you know, here's our policy, it's like, it's done. It's, it's done. Yeah. And you have to horizon scan two years in advance to see what, what's gonna happen, how you can influence it. And that's how you get, that's how you, that's how you do stuff. And it's learning that you think, oh, okay. And do you feel you do that? I don't do it enough because one of the things time in time consuming. Well, I, I don't do it enough because it's time consuming. You've also got to be constantly knowing the wonks and people. Um, but, but I and that the, it should be part of what our subject associations do. Yeah. But one of the problems with our disciplines because it's very big and very vociferous, we don't have we have two subject associations, the English Association and the University of English, both of which uh, in, pre in the past have been a bit quiescent. The last four or five years have become much more uh, active and alive and paying attention to things. Um, 
and they're beginning to horizon scan in a more effective kind of way and work together. Mm. But I mean, academics are, are difficult people because they want to do what they want. I want to go and write my books in my study, and you know, that's what I want to do. I don't really want to engage with this and find out what secondary school teachers are doing. And yet, if we don't look after our own garden, it will get run over. Mm. So I feel sort of you have to sort of do that. And I also think, well, I think it's quite interesting. It's Absolutely. really interesting to find out how stuff happens. Yeah. I mean, if it wasn't interesting, I would probably think it's worthy but dull. But it, it's yes. just fascinating. Yes.